Is it fine with the mic? Good morning, everyone. Welcome on the third day of ITM plenary meeting in Sofia. We are very happy to greet you with this nice raining outside. So I hope it's, it's more fresh than the days before. So let's start. We have a fantastic program today. But what is important, we have the, the second uh, keynote speech. And I am delighted to present you uh, Ms. Margarita Dorovska. She's a very um, good friend of ours. Um, even she's not being exactly in performing arts, but I know that she's always around. Uh, what we recognize her for in Bulgaria, uh, we uh, know her uh, like a curator. And she is uh, one of the ideologists, I don't think that this is a bad word here, um, behind the, 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 great, um, the great idea of Christo and Jean-Claude uh, Center that is um, in, in Gavrovo that has his start and I believe uh, will explode shortly. Uh, what else? Mm. She has this fantastic experience of uh, being in the independent scene in one hand, but on the other side, she was a great director of a uh, um, museum of humor and satire in Gabrovo. Um, and this made difference. We saw it. I, I believe that uh, um, artists from the visual arts uh, knew that they, they noticed the difference. For this, I believe, seven years, you did great. Thank you for that. So I won't be uh, more long talk here. And let me introduce and thank you to, to be with us, Margarita Dorvska. Hello. Um, thanks, Vesel, for the very nice and kind introduction. Now, me speaking about uh, sense of place, sense of time is slightly ironic because I'm totally lost half of the time, have horrible sense of direction, and uh, also don't have very good sense of time. Um, it's very often an abstract concept. And uh, in that sense, I live with a condition. And managing this condition um, makes me more sensitive to the concepts of um, space and time. So uh, I guess that's enough of a reason to um, be able to discuss um, these issues. So as um, Vesela said, I started my uh, professional path in the visual arts, working with an amazing organization that was focusing on new media art within the field of visual arts. Uh, that was 2005, 2006, Interspace, and the first ever professional trip abroad that I had was to Helsinki um, for the plenary uh, there. And uh, it's Really great honor to be speaking to you today. <laughs> uh, ITM was the first international network that I experienced, and um, it was really amazing to see the energy, to see the power, the kind of collective intelligence, and also to understand um, the potential for advocacy that uh, a network like that has. And uh, it's really amazing also to be in Tupu Centrawa, which I believe um, was made a couple of ideas more possible exactly thanks to ITM on one hand. And uh, then also what Vesela mentioned, now the current project I'm working on, we are modeling the approach and the structure then on to put Centrawa. Uh, so, yeah, the independent, uh, the independent field, then I've also freelanced for a while. I even worked for a commercial gallery two months. It wasn't very successful. Uh, I've worked for the Ministry of Culture, and that was a huge learning curve, being in administration. Um, and then 
2016, I ended up in the Museum of Humor and Satire, uh, which is rather unique. I believe you haven't uh, visited many museums like that. Um, and it's also quite big. So these are four floors, 9,000 square meters, um, and a team of 27 people. I'd say understaffed for what we were trying to do. And on top of that, pretty much from the beginning, we had this, as a museum, this hobby project to give birth to the Christo and Jean-Claude Art Center. Um, now, how many of you have heard or know about the practice of Christo and Jean-Claude as an artist? Okay. Um, I'll say a couple of words just so that we anchor um, two of the characters that will be appearing um, again in this talk. Um, so Christo and Jean-Claude are well known for wrapping buildings and structures like the uh, Pont Neuf Bridge in Paris um, or the Reichstag in Berlin. And the last project you might have witnessed uh, at least on, on TV or on the internet is the wrapped Arc de Triomphe. Uh, that was realized 2021, and it was realized um, at a moment where both artists had already uh, passed away. So the project was uh, finished by uh, Christos' nephew, Vladimir Yavashev. Um, so why Christo and Jean-Claude Art Center in Gabrovo? Because Christo was born in Gabrovo. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, their final project. Uh, which is uh, yet to be realized. It was conceived in 1977, and once realized, it will be the largest sculpture ever created. Um, it is to be made out of 410,000 multicolored barrels, which form a colorful mosaic echoing Islamic architecture. So the mastaba is 150 meters high, 300 meters long at the vertical walls, and 225 meters wide at the 60 degree slanted walls. Um, it's going to be the only permanent project of Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, and um, yeah, supposedly it's going to be possible to see it uh, from outer space. So. Um, I hope that situates uh, our um, main characters well enough for those who are not familiar with their work. And now, speaking of art centers, we always speak of places, we speak of venues. Uh, after searching for quite some time, it turned out that the perfect building is just behind the Museum of Humor. What you're seeing here is a former um, textile vocational school. and. Um, Gabrovo is known for its textile industry, and here is the link between Cristo and uh, um, the materials that he was working uh, with, the fabric and um, the industrial history of uh, the city. Uh, so we already did the soft opening uh, with exhibitions, obviously we're presenting their work, but also, and very importantly, work by young contemporary artists. And we hope that uh, this is not just exhibition space, uh, but it's planned to be also production space. So that's the project um, I'm currently involved with, with quite an amazing uh, team of um, experts, curators, uh, people who work in finance, in communication, and um, so on. So that's, um, that's enough. Uh, for me and my experience so far. So, um, the first um, topic that we discussed when uh, Veselin suggested that uh, uh, invited me for the keynote speech, he mentioned three topics, and uh, I'm the kind of person who spreads themselves thin, and I was like, I want to speak about all three of them. So, we discussed trans locality. Um, and uh, if we want to know where we are, what time we are at. That's the kind of situation. Um, feels a bit like the world is shaking under our feet and it's permanently 
perpetually moving to the right. Um, what would be the opposite of translocality? If we think of movement of people, movement of ideas, movement of goods, or basically the way our civilization uh, has been established, well, the, probably the opposite would be the term indigenous. And um, now, according to Amnesty International, only 6% of the world population is indigenous. But then if you look at politics, and what politicians do, you'd imagine that all these 6% are MPs and in governments and speaking on TV. Indigenous people don't need necessarily to perform, to be seen performing uh, uh, folklore rituals and being dressed like that. They can also be dressed like that. Um, but now let's go back to, to politicians. That's very recent. We just had elections here in Bulgaria. Uh, and what you can see here is a screenshot, uh, TV anchor, TV host from our national TV, half an hour before the end of the elections, is inviting these two people who are the leaders of the second um, political party listed there, 3.6% at th that time. It comes out that it's very likely that this party will jump over the 4% barrier and will enter parliament. And it seems like nobody has ever expected that. It wasn't really um, suggested by sociologists, and that's a surprise. You can see it doesn't look like a very good surprise, judging by the face of the TV host, but also the party leaders seem to be surprised themselves. Um, maybe, maybe a bit scared. scared. Um, now they have to be in Parliament. And why, uh, why it is surprise? It's surprise because we had um, very low what we call electoral activity. Very, very few people uh, decided to go and uh, vote. So this really changes the proportion of, and the, 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 the percentage. Um, so... Why do we get surprised when things like that happen? Um, and how come that uh, very often it feels like we are in some sort of ivory towers, uh, balloons, um, and how come that we don't realize what's happening around us in the world? I'll share three short stories. Uh, all three of them have something to do with my work, but they're totally outside of the circle and people I work with. So the first story starts with this book. Uh, it's uh, The Gabrovo Jokes, uh, an edition of 1990 that was um, put out in a print run of 100,000 copies. So when I went uh, to the museum, there was one amazing uh, room that was used as storage to hold these copies. Imagine a wall like that from ceiling, from floor to ceiling uh, with these books. Why were they stored? Well, before 1989, the museum was very popular with uh, uh, tourists coming from the Soviet Union. Uh, Gabrovo jokes were popular there. and. Uh, after 1989, obviously that ceased, and nobody wanted to, didn't know what to do with these books, so they kept storing them, moving them from one place to another. And at that point, I was, okay, we have to clear this place. I want to um, use this as an exhibition hall. Um, and we started thinking, what to do with these books? Of course, you can't just destroy them. That would be horrible. So we were thinking, okay, it's great that the museum has a history with uh, uh, people living in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Obviously, that's um, kind of brand that's recognized, so maybe we can try to work with that. At that point, there were already many uh, Russian people buying uh, property along the Black Sea coast, so we started cleaning the books. Um, packing them, providing some um, contemporary, like, up updated information about what the museum is doing now, and try to place them in hotels, in restaurants, basically different places. And 
So far, so good. We sorted out with a lot of effort something like 1,000 books, and there were 99,000 more. Um, and one day, a lady comes to meet me and uh, says, Hi, I'm uh, Yulia. Uh, I'm Russian. I've been living here in Bulgaria for a very long time. And uh, I work with a, a club of uh, Russian wives here in Bulgaria. We organize events and we'll be very happy to do things together with the museum. And at that time point, I'm very happy as well, because I can immediately see how Yulia is going to help us attract uh, Russian tourists and uh, at some point get rid of these books. So we start organizing events together, and uh, like the day of the cosmonaut, that's uh, the word that would be used for astronaut, um, different teams, different topics, and like with every event, I realized that there is some really creepy agenda going along with that. At some point, I asked Yulia, Yulia, what are these clubs? How, clubs, how many of, their, of them there are in Bulgaria? And it turns out that's 2016, there are 600 clubs of uh, Russian wives. So the, the, these are women who live here and whose main purpose is to... Um, keep the Russian language as mother tongue for their children, which is amazing. Um, and uh, basically the benefit for people to be in these uh, clubs, alongside being um, with their compatriots, uh, was that uh, they would send the kids um, to study in Russia with full scholarship and um, yeah, basically all costs covered. Um, so. That was really surprising for me at that point to realize that there is such a network of Russian clubs. And when you read the news um, about uh, Russian spies in the West or even here, uh, you think of some very kind of complicated uh, system of well-trained professionals. Um, but not necessarily. There are also the Russian wives who are pushing amazing agenda. The last event, and that's where we parted ways with Yulia, she was she really wanted to have a contest, beauty contest, for girls, like six, seven-year-old girls, who are all made up with curly hairs or made-up hairs, nicely dressed, and uh, there would be a jury that would select the most beautiful girl. And that was it. We didn't do it, of course. Now, the second story, that's a very recent one. Uh, on Tuesday, we um, had a pre-meeting uh, visit uh, in Gabrovo, the day before on Monday, uh, some of you were in Veliko Trnovo. And we were coming back by bus. The bus ended up here in Tupotsetrava, quite late, almost midnight. And I had to go home by taxi. And uh, you can learn a lot about one city from its taxi drivers. Um, like um, the quintessential New Yorker. Uh, used to drive a cab for a living at some point in her life. Uh, but we are not in New York, we are in Sofia, so that's a fleet of uh, local cabs. So um, I'm in the cab, my battery is dead, there's nothing else I can do uh, but talk to the driver, I'm almost dead. Um, and um, he starts like a very, very um, kind of consistent uh, uh, rant again against uh, uh, politicians and then says, see, but see what happened now at the elections, things are going to get better. Enough with these LGBTQ people. Now there will be discipline, firm hand, and our country is going to get right in very, very short time. Uh, then he also had opinions about uh, foreign uh, policy and um, um, he explained that Z uh, Zelensky is a drug addict and that Putin who sort him out, that went for like a minute, minute and a half. And at that point I was really thinking, okay, what shall I do? Shall I ask him to just shut up and tell him I'm tired or try to converse in some manner? So I started um, asking him questions about himself, like his... Uh, uh, what he was doing, what his past was like, and uh, in very short time I figured out, A, that his grandfather was a Cossack, so coming from Russia, 
um, that he had done his uh, military service uh, at the border. Um, and um, in um, army, whatever it's called, um, uh, group uh, department that was responsible for sabotage and diversion. And as part of that, uh, he was sent with a group of 30 or 40 soldiers um, north from the um, power circle, uh, where they had further training in this. Um, that was somewhere in Siberia. Um, and that in 2017, um, he met um, his uh, girlfriend, with whom he has a long-distance relationship, and she is from Ekaterinburg. So in very short time, asking different questions and being curious about him, I could figure out that he has at least three points where kind of Russian culture is very important and sentimental for, uh, for him. Um, he assured me that, um, I mean, Russophobes like me, uh, we'll, we'll see very soon how things will start changing in this country. And he mentioned that, yes, military service should come back. Um, and uh, finally I got home. I opened the kitchen door. The garbage is stinking. My son has been the entire afternoon at home. That didn't bother him at all. And I'm like, sweetie, it's really smelly here. Would you go to throw out the, the garbage? He's like, hmm, tired. I really want to go to bed. I'll do it in the morning, first thing, when I go to school. And I'm like, okay, but military service, mandatory military service will come and, yeah. <laughs> Things will be different then. So, you know, talking to, to people with different opinions sometimes gives you really practically sense of balance. Now, the third story. Um, I was at an event here in Sofia and then had to travel back to Gabrovo with colleagues from Gabrovo municipality and we had uh, the notorious driver Vilu. Uh, I had to uh, pick up some picture frames uh, on the way and uh, on the phone I realized that they are not wrapped, they are on the third floor and it's going to take some time uh, to load them in the car, and at that point I realized I have to make friends with Vilu. He was really nice and helped me with the frames. We carried them, and we are in the car. I'm sitting next to him, we are already friends, we have some rapport, and um, he knows that I've worked for the Museum of Humor. And all of a sudden he pulls his phone and starts playing a video on YouTube, uh, kind of saying, okay, I know you are in culture, see what I do. I watched the video. Um, 10, 12 minutes, and it's a reenactment, a reenactment of Petluvden. I'm not going to explain what Petluvden is. Find a Bulgarian, ask them um, if they know uh, good, if they don't know, ask them to Google it. Um, but that's, that's not Vilius reenactment. That's a lady from uh, Golica, an old lady and uh, this young boy, and this cock is going to be butchered. Uh, I think there is huge potential for developing uh, some sort of genre between uh, Marina Abramovic and Tarantino with, with Tarantino and with a lot of blood and massacre. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the thing with reenactments. Here is another one, I'll leave it, especially for the Bulgarians to read the text that goes with it. And at the end of the video, um, I'm lost for words. And the I can muster is, Vilu, you have a very nice costume. And he goes like, yeah. Um, and I'm asking him, did you sew it? Did you buy it? What's this costume? He had the costume of a Turkish Pasha. And he said, well, these costumes are actually very expensive. Uh, but that's nothing. I've spent like 1,000 for my costume. And you know, in the South, there are rich business people who pay sometimes up to 40,000 for their costumes. And I'm like, okay, so how many of you are involved in this kind of things? And he said, well, there are so many reenactment clubs. And then I go and ask him, okay, how do you do it? Well, we go to the library, we research, uh, we develop a script, then we perform. Uh, then it's all video documented, um, and then we have like assemblies and special days when 
there are reenactments from all over the country, and it's all quite well coordinated because you don't want to see the same Petlyuk then reenacted by like five groups. So there is an organized movement around reenactments. And this I wouldn't have known if it wasn't for Vilio. Um, so there was a, almost like a meme, this uh, um, story around uh, this guy, Peter Mackindle, um, who invented a stunt uh, going around with his uh, bus uh, with some merch and insisting that birds are not real. Um, for those of you who don't know the whole story, his statement is that in 1959, the government started killing birds and replacing them with drones to make surveillance on people. And up to now, all the birds are replaced. So what you're seeing is not birds, it's drones. He was going around preaching this thing, and obviously people would get mad at him. Uh, and he would do it like with a total deadpan sense of being very serious. And then uh, this movement had followers. So there were other people who started equipping buses like that, going around and basically having some, those, some weird fun with this thing. But uh, the result of his um, experience was that he figured out that um, even nice people get very prickly very nasty, um, and uh, very quickly lose temper when faced with uh, situations like that. Um, and uh, what he's doing now, he is uh, starting a political movement with the entire experience of uh, meeting so many people on the streets, ordinary people. And he seems to be very successful because he already had one uh, stunt with the uh, um, Council of Brooklyn uh, and managed to um, get a lot of support from uh, unexpected, unexpectedly a lot of support from um, young people who are generally considered to be apolitical. So, um, all these three examples um, are things that I didn't read in the newspapers, but people I met, and uh, although uh, we could have different opinions and view of um, life, I was still curious to understand what's the background of their sentiments and, uh, um, yeah. Um, and then to move from the world around us and the uh, unexpected, uh, supposedly sociolo sociological things that happen, let's move to uh, the individual and to ourselves um, and uh, go towards burning in, burning out. So this is uh, the definition of the World Health Organization uh, on symptoms of um, burnout. Um, and if we unpack them, sustained feel feelings of exhaustion, this is more than being tired at the end of the week or even at the end of a busy season. It is a sense of utter depletion or fatigue that comes from being overextended for a prolonged period of time without adequate or regular recovery periods. Uh, this sculpture with human body has even a uh, more impressive form. This is the plank piece too. Um, and then the second one, personal inefficacy. When you feel like Sisyphus pushing the same boulder up a hill each day at work, only to have it roll back down, it not only creates tremendous feelings of frustration, but also greatly diminishes any sense of accomplishment, productivity, or meaning that we might derive from our work. And then, increased mental distance. This is the last hallmark of burnout. Um, it is essentially disengagement, characterized by feelings of cynicism or negativity towards one's job. While some mental distance from work can be healthy, like putting work into perspective and not having your identity too wrapped up in it, this type of withdrawal or mental distance from your job is more pronounced and can manifest as antipathy, aversion, or even loathing. 
This is in contrast to what every employer and employee want, a sense of engagement, fulfillment, or even pride you take in your work. Now, artists and art people have um, different kind of work, and um, uh, still there is more and more, um, I mean, more and more often we, we hear about people on the verge of burnout. Um, and um, I was listening to an interview with a really amazing artist, Lisa Yuskagave, who is now um, selling for millions, really. Uh, but uh, for a very long time, 20 or 30 years, he didn't ha she didn't have any commercial success. Um, based in New York, um, and you can see this work is very much uh, engaged with the studio and uh, the condition of the artist and the environment of the artist. Um, so, um, for 20 or 30 years, she had to day in, day out, do whatever she was doing without um, any indication of, uh, of success, of being able to sell her paintings. She was going to therapy and there was almost um, in, um, in, in, in a state of uh, yeah, prolonged burnout, maybe. The most excru excruciating story that she was telling in this interview was that uh, um, it was really painful when she would go to openings of uh, her artist friends and after that someone would say, oh, let's go to a restaurant. And she and her husband, who was also an artist, they didn't even have money to go to a restaurant, so the usual thing they would do would be to order um, and share uh, the, a dish of the simplest and cheapest pasta. And in the end, it worked out for her. Um, but as much as uh, the narrative of the suffering artist is uh, prevalent and we are used to it, I mean, even better if they cut their ears off, the question is, can you burn in without necessarily burning out? And uh, here I would like to go back to Christo and Jean-Claude and one of their early projects and um, share with you also why I'm so interested in their practice and the way they worked, because I think it gives a lot of, a lot of answers um, exactly to this question, how to have a sustained career um, over a long time producing uh, super ambitious projects like this one. So this is the running fence, it's 5.5 meters high, 39.4 kilometers long, extend, uh, extending east-west near uh, Freeway 101, north of San Francisco, on the private properties of 59 ranchers, following the rolling hills and dropping down to the Pacific Ocean at Bodega Bay. The running fence was completed on September 10th, 1976. This project took 42 months to be realized. And to peep a bit uh, in the practice of Christo and Jean-Claude, it starts like this, with planning, with preparatory sketches, where every single detail uh, is put on paper. And this is actually what Christo and Jean-Claude sell in order to fund their projects. Um, they don't take donations, they don't take sponsorships, all their projects are funded by themselves. And this is a rather unique um, model in the visual art world. Uh, that's Christo in his studio working. But unlike um, the painting of Lisa Yuskagave, there is uh, then the moment where you have to go out and uh, do the project in... Um, in the real world. Um, here is a very nice quotation because that's one of their really most difficult early projects where they had quite an impressive, um, quite an impressive uh, learning curve. They had to um, arrange that all these 59 ranchers would agree to have their land used for this project so that the running fence runs through their property. We tried to see everything those ranchers were doing because there was no way to convince those ranchers if we did not understand their business or their hobbies. The running fence is the same thing. For us, coming from New York, roping a little cow is a very stupid thing, as you may be thinking. 
Uh, building a running fence is a stupid thing. This is the way we started to communicate. The only way was to go and spend days and days on the site and with the ranchers in the field, with them and the stock. Um, at the livestock auction, learn how they were living and know their business and know the price of milk and the cattle and the meat and feed. That's from um, an interview Christo gave in 1977. Um, and this is the moment of the real installation and that requires uh, huge teams of people who are coordinated, who are motivated um, and uh, who understand the project and really burn for, for it and want to be part of it. Uh, and then comes the best part when the project is realized and uh, sometimes we don't even plan time for this. To really savor the moment and uh, enjoy it. So as usual, this uh, project by Christo and Jean-Claude was um, only temporary. Um, and was after that dismantled uh, and uh, the place was uh, fully recycled and returned to its uh, initial, uh, initial site. Um, why do I speak of uh, projects and why, why I think that's really uh, an interesting way to approach uh, what we do because projects have beginning and end and if we want to um, steer and navigate change in a changing world it's not very easy to behave as uh, Baron Munchausen to try to pull ourselves by, uh, by the hair or uh, in another me metaphor to try to repair the car while driving it. Change requires its own space and time uh, and it requires dedication. Um, in my time at the Museum of Humor I realized that every little change that we wanted to make in an institution with 50 years of history, uh, with existing habits, a very clear uh, presence in uh, among audiences, the only way to achieve change is to dedicate space and time. You cannot just put it um, on the shoulders of people who are anyway doing some operational uh, activities and expect that they'll have to transform some, something on top of that. Every pro project that really aims to create change needs to happen as a project and to have, I mean, even when you're understaffed, have a uh, you know, half an afternoon dedicated to something specific so that it really uh, takes place. That's a really businessy book. I haven't read it, um, but it sounds... Uh, I listened to the podcast with the author, and he totally made sense. And since I haven't read the book, I wouldn't recommend the book. I would recommend that you listen to the podcast. That's exactly what he talks about. Um, if we want to, uh, if we want to make change, we have to consider projects and learn how to navigate um, uh, with projects. So um, that's for me. Thank you so much, Margarita. You have given us a lot of food for thought. We have a few minutes for a Q&A, but we do have to leave the room at the very, very, very latest 5 to 11, because Pizzerama needs time to prepare. So do we have some burning questions in the room for Margarita? This is your chance. Nan. I wonder if you see the running fence from Christo, if it reminds you. I can't look at it without thinking about a concrete fence that is separating indigenous people from their land. And I thought, uh, might that, yeah, how that rings in your imagination. Does it only ring to the 
taking down of the Berlin Wall, or does it also connect with a, an actual wall that has been built quite recently? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good reference. Uh, actually, when I look at the running fans, my first um, association would be of a ribbon, and uh, something that's quite, um, mm, quite nice. But then it's in, you're right, it's in the title, it is a fence. Um, and as much as Christo and Jean-Claude tend to not make political statements with their uh, art, their art speaks for themselves and it can be, it's very open to interpretation and um, very often we can make uh, very clear uh, kind of political um, associations coming out of it. Um, in their first, probably uh, one of, yeah, in their first uh, public art project uh, that uh, brought very strong media attention, um, they uh, blocked a tiny street in Paris, Rue Visconti, with oil barrels, um, and this one was called Iron Curtain. Um, so, 1977, I think, was the year for the running fans uh, when it was completed. Maybe, in a sense, it could have been a precursor or a very kind of early um, premonition. Any other last questions? All the way up there, I think it's Ali. Hi. Introduce yourself. Do you, hi, I'm Ellie. Welcome Collection, London. Do you think the work is visual art, performance, or something completely different of Christo and Jean-Claude? Um, Ellie, first of all, I'm a big fan of Welcome Collection, so um, <laughs> uh, good to meet you, although from distance. Um, it's very difficult to define. I mean, the, the, the uh, objects that are produced in, in the studios, in, in the studio and the drawings, they're, we're quite clear about them. They're drawings, they're collages, uh, they're sculptures, that's clear. But then how should we consider the project? And I think that's why they use the word project because they have sculptural qualities, uh, they are situated um, either in urban environment or um, in the landscape. Uh, they deal a lot with our um, sense of landscape. They leave an indelible image, like an after image, once they are dismantled. But then one of the most um, intimate things around their projects is when you actually visit and, and perceive them in, by yourself um, because you have your own sensation, very, very, very physical, very often. And at the same time, it's a collective experience because there are people around and everyone is in their own mind. So you do become a performer in a sense. And uh, I think it's um, exactly all of this wrapped together. Uh, that makes their projects uh, so special and so distinct in, in even in, in art history. It's very unusual the way they work. Um, and they work with uh, the environment, the place, um, as they often say, with the wind and the water, uh, but also with the audience and their, their sensations and, uh, yeah. Thank you, Margarita. If I don't see a hand coming up right now, oh, we do. It's the last one, guys. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the understanding of the work of Christo and Jean-Claude in Bulgaria. Because I am from here, and I know I had to go abroad and get educated abroad to understand. <laughs> and I know, and you were, you were talking a bit about the context here, and what people think, and what the mass if we can generalize things. And I'm interested in Gabrovo, how does the, the audience 
understand, and also what is the work it takes to educate an audience that understands contemporary art? First of all, in Gabrovo, the idea about the Christian Jean-Claude Center started in the early 90s. Uh, and it was propelled by a group of local intellectuals um, who, in 1990, published in the local newspaper, we have this amazing artist who was born in Gabrovo, and we need to have a permanent exhibition of the work of Christian and Jean-Claude here in town. And at that point, they started working on this project. Um, it was... Um, taking off, then dipping. Um, but what really started the project was uh, in 2017 when we organized two exhibitions. Uh, one was about Christian Jean-Claude's projects, and uh, that was uh, an exhibition with 50 posters, but mostly telling the story behind each project. Uh, and then the other one was called Born in Gabrovo, which was based on uh, research material collected by Evgenia Tanasov Teneva, whom most of the Bulgarians know as a TV journalist, but she's also a researcher and um, an art historian, especially uh, focusing on uh, Christo's biography. Uh, and uh, part of the museum team uh, did extra research at the State Archive in Gabrovo. And at some point it was very clear how you can, can trace connections between, between what Christo is doing and the materials he is using and what was surrounding him as a, as a child. Uh, and this exhibition was m quite interesting and very special because that's the, the part about uh, Christo that we don't know. Um, and first, this exhibition was very well visited. I can sense that behind your question... Um, stands uh, the, the point of opposition to Christo's art as well. There's been, uh, in the past 30 years, that there's also been um, quite incredible media coverage, uh, nonsensical about Christo's projects, because they just don't fit in what in our tradition of art making, and it's not necessarily easy to recognize as, as art. Uh, but exhibitions were really important. Um, to be able to communicate, uh, to discuss uh, with different people. And at that point, you realize that actually their work is, um, is very, very accessible for audiences. Because you'd have, let's say, someone who is an engineer, and you talk to them about the engineering solutions that they involve in their project. Then you'd have someone who is, uh, let's say, an environmentalist, ecologist, and then you can discuss the environmental impact studies that are done for every project and um, the efforts that go into recycling the material. So you realize that this connects very easily to different groups of people. The one group of people that are the toughest are those who uh, are really focused on language and the question whether he speaks, he spoke Bulgarian or not, and why did he never return? That's, that's the toughest part. <laughs> Basically, I think through, through talking, to, through making exhibitions, and that's what we are trying also to do with the center now, to have as many activities running in the building as it is in before, even before the, the renovation. Um, and the moment people are able to, for a while, leave their prejudice and bias and be a bit open, I mean, the, the, the work of Christian Jean-Claude is very, very easy to connect to, actually. We really do not have time. I am so sorry. Okay, just say it. Okay, just comment. Okay, comment. Thank you. Oh, this is, is, yes, it's working. Well, actually, I wanted to say that the very first time I encountered Christo and Jean Claude's was uh, maybe like 85 um, in Sofia. And my parents were living in uh, the Stuti city, uh, the student city, and they had posters of his work in the accommodation. So I was like three or four years old, and I was literally growing up with Christo and Jean Claude in Sofia. So I don't know what happened to those posters, but blimey, they are somewhere in Sofia. So I just wanted to finish on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you. Thank you all.